temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our message this morning comes from the book of Philippians. I want to talk to you about perfect peace, the glorious river of God. We sang that hymn just a few moments ago, Like a River Glorious. And it's based on Philippians chapter 4 and a few other verses, uh, Romans chapter 5 particularly. But um, as we read, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Hear these words from the Lord's Apostle. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Rejoice. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone you see, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. Right, the writer of the hymn, like a River Glorious, which we did sing a few moments ago, was Francis Ridley Havergal. Boy, that's a name. Uh, Francis Ridley Havergal. She only lived a short life. 42 years is a short life. And it was in the middle of the 19th century that she wrote about 50 different hymns, many of which are still uh, were published and are still in church hymnals around the world and are used these days. This hymn, Like a River Glorious, came about because a friend wrote her a letter in which she shared her struggle about her faith, particularly about her salvation. She was worried that she was actually saved. And Francis wrote back to her and quoted one of Paul's letters upon which she wrote this hymn. Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. She went on to say in that letter that peace, she wrote to her friend, peace is yours already. It was purchased for you. It was made for you. It was sealed for you. And it was pledged to you by the word of the Father and the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. That's the kind of letter I like to get. Well, apparently Francis recognized in her friend who wrote that letter the vicious cycle that many of us Christians can get into. We struggle to feel at peace. In the last year and a half, have you felt a whole lot at peace? You know, with COVID going on and being estranged basically from our neighbors and friends, unable even to shake hands. We struggle to feel at peace and the vicious cycle goes this way and the harder we struggle, the less peace we feel. Get that? You want peace, you struggle to find peace and the more you struggle, the less peace you feel. And it makes us struggle even more. So what does that do to the prospects of finding peace? Well, God's peace is a gift that's already given. And Francis Havigal wrote to her friend, we don't have to fight for it because it's a gift from God. Peace is a gift from God. When it comes to struggling to feel at peace, I find that there are two dangers, two dangers and one safe place. That's what I want to share with you this morning as we prepare for the table together. <laughs> Danger number one is when we are always in struggle mode. We're always feeling the absence of peace and we're struggling to find it. There's peace around the corner somewhere, or if I just do this, or if I can just get it, if I read my Bible enough, if I pray. What does that sound like to you? Whew. Exhausting, right? 
Some of us are perfectionists. Any of you married to one? Don't answer that. <laughs> I like you too much to put you in that situation. In Francis Havergal's day, there was a rash of that amongst the Christian churches. People were trying to be the perfect Christian. Somehow, they forgot that that job had been accomplished perfectly on Calvary years before. Well, as Methodists, I think we sling around that term perfection a little too loosely sometimes. Sometimes we say it like the man who just announced to a worldwide audience on CNN that he had just achieved perfect humility. You know, perfectly humble. Here I am, perfectly humble. Well, we are not to be like that. Rather, we are to be going on to perfection in love. That's how John Wesley expressed it. Not that we are acting perfectly, doing everything just exactly right. By being perfected in love, Wesley was talking about Acting with humility and kindness and grace toward other people, not being a perfect person. Actually, that's not a possibility for fallen human beings. Even though we may be redeemed, none of you, I hate to say it, is perfect. We're not perfect in the way we look. We're not perfect in the way we speak. We're not perfect in the way we act. We don't do everything we should, and we do some things that we shouldn't. Amen? Yeah. Can I get a witness? Amen. Or do you just not believe that? Somehow, grasping at perfection as if it's something you can master within yourself misses the whole point that Paul made about finding peace. He spoke to real people who had the same kinds of sin problems that you and I have. They were not perfect people, and they knew it. And so Paul told them what to do about it. He said, rejoice. Then he said it again. Again, I say, rejoice. I believe that Paul said that in his best capital letters voice. You know how if you're texting somebody and you put something in all capitals, what does it mean? It means, ah, wow, hear it, right? I believe Paul said this in his best capital letters verse so they would get it. Rejoice is the antidote to not having peace or to the struggle. People who are forever struggling over finding peace are like folks who bring an elephant gun to a mosquito fight. May make a lot of noise, but you're not going to kill many bugs. Struggle does not produce peace. Rather, it is a formula for spiritual coronary. That's how to go under, is to struggle to find peace. A second danger that I find in this is just the opposite. It's hardly struggling and despairing of ever finding peace. In other words, to give up. This is the other side of struggling as a vocation, which is pursuing peace as if it's a prize to be uh, it's a trophy to be put in your trophy cabinet somewhere. This other side, hardly struggling at all, hardly even attempting to look for peace, hardly thinking you could ever find peace, this is fatalism. It's resigning oneself to the difficulty of peace in a warring, sin-sick world, writing off any part of having any part of it. This is even losing the desire to pray for peace. The essence of despair, it's giving up. You know, some people struggle so hard to find peace. They're looking for it around every bush, around every corner. They're looking for it in every kind of different or new experience. Some people go church hopping looking for that peace. Do they actually find it? No, no. This is losing the desire to even pray for peace. The essence of despair, giving up. But yet, Paul's letters are filled with military and athletic competition analogies. Paul encourages us to, uh, in Galatians chapter 5, he says, run the race. That doesn't sound like giving up, does it? He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, fight a good fight. That doesn't look like the sparing of ever winning, ever finding peace. And when it comes to being God's worker in the field, Paul encourages us to give everything we have got to please God. Listen to what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. And you tell me 
if there's any give up in what Paul is saying here. He says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker. That doesn't sound like somebody giving up. But as God's co-laborers, you and I are not struggling to find peace. What we're doing is we are laboring to show others the prince of peace. There's the difference. We haven't given up in despair and unbelief. Because there in the fields of God's vineyard, when we labor shoulder to shoulder and we don't complain about it, but we learn to rejoice in all things, we are the very essence of the hard-working servant that's going to hear the words out of the master's mouth, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your master. And that is a place of rest. So these are two dangers. The first is always struggling, thinking that you're going to find peace if you just press the pedal to the metal. And the other danger is taking your foot off the gas altogether and just giving up and saying, well, it's unattainable, so I won't even bother thinking about it. Those are the two dangers. What are they? Those are the extremes, aren't they? Where do you generally find that the truth bears out? It's in the middle. The safe place. And that's what I call resting in his unchanging grace. That's where you'll find peace like a glorious river always. The second verse of Habergal's song, Like a Glorious River, we have the image of Moses hidden in the hollow place, the cleft of the rock. And both of those are metaphors for being like the children's song. He's got the whole world where? In his hands. When you're there, what can happen? What can happen when you're there in his hand? Covered there with the hand of God, like Moses was placed in the cleft of the rock and covered by the hand of God as God moved past him with all of his glory. Moses couldn't even bear to look because of the glory of God. But when God was past, he was able to glimpse the Shekinah presence of God from God's posterior as he moved away from the rock. Nothing can assail or corrupt God's plans. He's entirely unhurried by both joys or sorrows and trials in our lives. And in that condition, when we are in his hand, when we experience his perfect grace, you and I also experience the river of peace. It's glorious and it's victorious. It's perfect grace and peace. It's there that we experience that grace and peace fuller and deeper, as Francis Havergal wrote, every day. Did you see that? Those who trust him wholly find him wholly true, deeper and fuller every day. So, to the business of the day, which the Apostle Paul called the peace that passes the understanding, it's not found in struggle. It's not found in giving up hope. That perfect peace is found in surrendering to the safe place of communion with God. It's when we place our hand firmly in his hand, trusting, trusting him fully for that peace. We do this because as Francis Ridley Havergal understood and wrote, they who trust him wholly find him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Let's pray together. Father, as we move to this place of perfect peace and rest in communion with our blessed Lord, let us give Francis Havergal the last word from another hymn she wrote. The hymn, Lord, is so short, but it helps us open the front entry door to perfect communion and thereby perfect peace. Lord, as she wrote, we pray, in full and glad surrender I give myself to thee, thine utterly and only, and evermore to be. Son of God, who lovest me, I will be thine alone, and all I have and am, Lord, shall henceforth be thine own. Reign over me, Lord Jesus, so make my heart thy throne. It shall be thine, dear Savior, it shall be thine alone. O come and reign, Lord Jesus, rule over everything. And keep me always loyal and true to thee, my King. Come, Holy Spirit, 
Embrace us with thy power and love us as we dine together in perfect peace and rest. Amen. You have in your hands the elements of the Eucharist, the bread representing the body of Christ, the cup representing the blood of Christ. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he lifted it to the Father. He broke the bread. And then he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take this and eat. It is my body given to you for the forgiveness of sins. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and he blessed the cup, offering it to the Father. And he said to his disciples, I want you to take this. I want you to drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant in my sacrifice for you. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for the gift of this communion. Lord, as we sing, open my eyes. I can think of nothing more than the bread and the cup that opens our understanding. Our understanding of what you have given for us. And therefore, where our perfect peace lies. Not in struggling after it. Not in giving up in despair, but in that safe place of holy communion with you, and that kind of communion with everyone else who is in communion with you. Lord, it is there that we find that we belong to everyone who belongs to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.